it's time to sit down and relax for the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A with your host, Doug. Hey there. So the last sequel that we did was Home Alone 3. And last week was our interview with Lenny Van Dolan. I hope you enjoyed him. He's great. Check out all of his awesome movies that he did, especially Electric Dreams. So this week, we have yet another interview from Home Alone 3, and it's the dad in the movie, Kevin Kilner. Kevin's career of acting didn't start like others that you've heard us interview before. And he was recently in a play that was a satire about parents paying for their kids to get into college. I think you know where I'm going with this one. And the play was in its final week when the whole Lori Loughlin USC scandal broke out. So it got extended a few weeks and he was real busy, but we were finally able to chat. Uh, yeah, he was in a lot of great sitcoms and guest roles over the years. One of the best Frasier episodes ever. And he was a lead on a CBS show with Nancy Travis in the early 90s. And he's in probably one of the most memorable scenes besides the apple pie and in the American Pie franchise. So... Kevin has some stories that will blow your mind, and I had so much fun chatting with him. Let's start the interview. Uh, I was working on um, a play by Joshua Harmon called Admissions that was done at Lincoln Center last March. And I was doing it down at Studio Theater in, in, uh, <clears throat> in D.C., and it, it just opened in London. It's been being done on the West Coast as well, and uh, it's being read for the Pulitzer. It's kind of... It was even being read for the Pulitzer before the FBI probe and, and all that stuff blew. Oh, really? That, well, that was just like lightning, you know, striking. And, and our, our play, the parents don't write checks, but they quote unquote make phone calls um, in the old, you know, the old fashioned way of like, <clears throat> let me see who I know. Do I know anybody like graduated from there? See if they can get the admissions office to look at you again. And, you know, our son gets... Structurally, in the play, the son gets uh, waitlisted to Yale, and the mother really wants him to go. The son really wanted to go. The father's like, you know, he'll, he'll be fine. Let him go to Dartmouth. Let him go to Duke. He's a really top student. He'll be fine. And the mother talks to the father and is, you know, saying, you know, let the kid pursue his dreams. We can at least make a couple phone calls. Well, audiences really love it because it was a satire. It's a really, really funny play. And, and uh, like, from beginning to end, it's, like, really funny, like, incredibly funny lines. And uh, it's a very liberal couple. And like the son goes on this rant that ends up being somewhat racist where he breaks down, you know, how do you decide whether someone's a person of color or not? How, how do you want to slice this and dice this and go back and forth? I mean, you know, uh, he talks about like, you know, my mother's Jewish, my father's a wasp, you know, my, my grandfather, on my mother's side was kept out of an Ivy League school because they had super intense quotas against Jews in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But now, they shocker, they found a new way to keep Jews out. They just made us white instead. You know, and the audience is like roaring at these lines. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're doing this play and, and they're loving it. And we were extended, I think. We'd already been extended twice, maybe three times. Then the FBI thing hits. That's wild. And it's just like, you, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, you yeah. Can't, I called my wife and I said, you know, this will never, ever happen again in my life because in less than 24 hours, I'm literally in the hottest play in America. Like their, their, their box, they tripled their, their box office sales. It was crazy. Well, and where are you performing at? Yeah. This the studio theater was in Washington. D it is in Washington, DC. Oh, awesome. Okay. It was down there. And, uh, um, but it's just, it was, you know, I remember, you know, my agent sent it to me and I, when I read it, I was like about 10 pages into it and I was like, man, this guy can really write. It's really funny, really insightful, you know, really like it's a real modern satire. That's just great writing. And I'm sort of at this place in my career where I, I'm just following the great writing wherever that leads. I don't yeah. care. I don't care if it's Washington, DC. I don't care if it's like some independent film in, you know, Vancouver. I don't really care. I just, yeah. wherever there's really good writing. Yeah. Where's your Where's your home base, LA? It was, but uh, you know, my wife before she was even my wife, Jordan and I were in LA for fifteen years. But we both started in New York, New York. Theater. Oh, nice! And uh, and so when we turned fifty, I said, you know, it's time to go back. We're theater people, and oh, okay, so you're right by me. I'm in Jersey. Yeah, so I live in uh, Japan, Tappan. Oh, okay. Yeah, where are you what? in Jersey? I'm in New Providence, so right by Summit. 
I don't know where that is, but is that northern, central, or what? Uh, uh, like central, northern. Cool. I'm about like 35 minutes from the city, like so not that far. Cool. Tell me, your, tell me about your your your, your podcast. And all. Like, I, I'm curious. Yeah. So what? Uh, cool, like when, yeah. Me, when I read your idea, like there was such a yeah. I was like, really, someone's doing Roman numeral movies. We used to make. I used to make jokes to people. I used to say, I only do movie after American Pie Two. I literally was going around going to my acting friends. They were like, Oh, I see you're in another Roman numeral movie. I said, Yeah, I only do sequels and trequels. <laughs> That's great. But, uh, no, uh, I I think it's like a fascinating concept. So. Some movies really work. So recently I interviewed, do you remember, obviously, Police Academy? Yeah. So I interviewed Lance Kinsey, who played uh, Proctor. Mm -hmm. And I think that franchise is like one of the, I think they're the exception to the rule. Because they, whoever was the casting director, whoever was involved in that, they really were able to keep like a core group of people in it. Right. A lot of the sequels, you get to like the third, fourth, you don't even recognize it. Like if it wasn't called like, just like those American Pie like spinoffs, they basically call it American Pie and they the Naked Mile or right. Beer Pong or whatever they call them. If you didn't see the American Pie, you'd think it wasn't even affiliated. So I've always been fascinated with sequels, whether it be the good sequels or the ones that aren't as good. But I think each movie in itself, just to get a movie made, is fascinating. So some yeah. have really funny stories behind it. Like we cover Caddyshack 2, right. which the story behind that one's like mind blowing. Just the fact that Rodney was like involved until they really started shooting and then he pulled out. So that whole movie was supposed to be centered around Rodney Dangerfield, which would have been great. <laughs> Why did he, I don't know that story. Why did he pull out? It was a whole like argument with the studio. So it was like a lot of these stories you hear about bad movies. Yeah. Like speed Two cruise control. So like Sandra Bullock, they were like, Hey, we'll fund. I think it was hope floats. We'll fund Hope Floats if you do this movie. And even though Keanu Reeves wasn't in it, she still did it. So her passion movie that she wanted to get done. So it kind of happened with Rodney, but it was like this whole thing with the studio. They wanted to rush him on it. Harold Ramis was like still on board. Like he was writing it for Rodney. And then once Rodney dropped out, Harold Ramis, like he wanted to get his name off the movie. He has nothing to do with it, but it's still in the credits. He was like, like upset about it, but. But anyway, so yeah, so just sequels, I think they're, I think they in themselves have great things. And I want to start more like how you got started and then we'll get to there. Sure. So, so where do you, are you from New York? No, I, I, I grew up uh, in Maryland. I was born in Baltimore. Oh, and nice. We moved out of the city when I was uh, four to the country. And I, I grew up in a real farm, kind of like a farming region. And uh, there was a little Episcopal school up the road that I, parents sent me to and then my mom started working there so uh because she was transitioning from being a painter to working in the classroom they just they needed a paycheck they needed a steady income and and um and we got to go to the, my sister and i got to go to the school for free because she was she ended up getting her teacher certificate and teaching there and she went on to touch she became a public school teacher in baltimore county for 25 years so oh wow um so she talked for 30 years and um and, uh, we, you know, we lived out there and, and my dad was a salesman. He sold everything from shoes to cars to insurance to um, advertising, direct marketing stuff. Um, and he wasn't a great, he, he, he was a good average, he was a, <laughs> he was a good salesman. He, wasn't, he didn't make a lot of money, but he was a good salesman and, and uh, he was a good guy. He loves, he loves stories and he loved jokes and, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I was a hyperactive kid and, um, you know, like truly, truly probably, you know, today I would be just diagnosed as I was like an ADD kid. And, uh, and you know, my mom had like almost had a nervous breakdown. She was like, you know, if you don't get that kid in the sports, I'm leaving this house. Like literally told my father that. And so he signed me up for football and lacrosse. And, you know, eventually I was wrestling in the winter too. And, you know, I was just always in a sport and, um, Went to a public high school in Timonium, Maryland called uh, Delaney High School. And then um, I got recruited in, uh, from a couple colleges for football and you know, two or three, four others for lacrosse. And I, I wanted to play lacrosse. So and my dream had always been to play at the school I had watched the most, which was Johns Hopkins. So yeah. I'm there and, you know, it was a very, uh, you know, I was a role player. I was, a you know, sat on the bench my first two years practically. I mean, I played a little bit my sophomore year, but 
mostly played my junior and senior year um, in a role position, but, you know, played on some great, you know, played on three national championship teams. We won three in a row. We were the first first team in the modern era, the modern era being defined by they started a, a Final Four and um, an NCAA tournament in 1970. And I was uh, playing, and we won 78, 79, 80, and we were the first team. They were, Cornell won 76, 77. Then we beat them in 78. We beat Maryland in 79. We beat, and we beat University of Virginia in 80. And then Carolina beat us in 81. Oh, so you, you were at four. That's pretty phenomenal. I was actually at five. I, 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 oh, you redshirted? Sh- well, I had, shattered a, I had had a thumb shattered in practice, a couple steel pins in it, and I redshirted in 78. And I came back and played on the practice squad, you know, being the, you know, the scout team thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I played on – I played – I actually was at five national championships. That's amazing. So when did, uh, when did acting come about within all the lacrosse practices? And- no, no, not at all. I mean, you know, I mean, especially when I played and the, the game was – it's funny, I, I referee lacrosse now at the youth level. And, oh, wow. And the game has been very, very progressive about getting ahead of the curve on concussion syndrome. And uh, you can't, you, you can no longer declare a player and you can't hit a player when, you know, he's not, he doesn't have both feet on the ground. If he has any part of his body, like if his hand is touching the ground or his elbows on the ground, you can't, you can't blow him up. You can't hit him the way we could in our days. You know, we oh, could wow. do, we just, you could bury guys in my day, you know, and guys were always on the ground and guys always had concussions. I mean, you know, one of my teammates, uh, Died at age 50. I mean, we figured he had over a dozen concussions. Oh, he, wow. He was fighting depression and a lot of other things. But uh, um, it was just a much rougher sport back in the day. But And, I, and I'm and i not proud of that at all. I'm just saying that's the way it was. I, I'm actually grateful that the sport has been so progressive because now it relies on athleticism, which I think all sports should. You know, basketball had its goon era and ice, yeah. ho- ice hockey had its goon era. And it doesn't really work. I mean, yeah, you can goon and all that, but people just end up getting crippled for life and it's bullshit. You know, it's like, let's yeah. be, be a great athlete, you know? So I, I was doing that and, um, I went into banking. Um, I became a credit analyst for about a year and a half and I was a commercial loan officer of fortune 500 companies for a bank in Baltimore. And I hated it from the second, I think about the <laughs> second, second week I was there. I you know, really hate it. By the second month I was there, I was like, this is huge. This is a huge, huge mistake. And um, the way I dealt with it was, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was getting depressed. I mean, I, the way I dealt with it was I, I, I went back to school at night, I took a couple semesters of journalism, thought I wanted to be a journalist, a couple semesters. I wanted to write fiction writing. And during this time, I was playing club lacrosse. I played a year of, uh, played for the Baltimore Eagles for minor, minor league football team for a year that was like a, like the, probably the gutter, you know, D team for the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, I can't imagine there was anything below us. Um, were you getting paid for that? Now, nah, some of the guys on the team were, you know, the quarterback was, and some of the star players were, but, you know, I, again, I was just a role player yeah. there. I just wanted to play. I wanted to see if I could play still. That's you know? awesome. Um, but you know, there's fast and then there's NFL fast and there's, yeah. a, big, there's a big difference. You know? Yeah. I mean, you might think you're fast in college and then you get to, you see guys that are going to get shots at the pros and these guys are like lightning, you know? So I know it's like watching, I don't know if you have you had a chance to watch the AAF yet. Not yet. It's like, it's so slow. Like plays develop so slow. Yeah. Yeah. Because guys, you know, it's just, they're, they're freakish at the pro level. They're just freakishly fast. They're incredibly yeah. quick. And you can't believe someone that big can move like that. And you're like, Phew. um, and I was, I remember I was playing strong safety and I was hitting like our tight end in practice was 240, 245. And I was about 205. And I mean, you know, you're giving up 40 pounds. It's like hitting a tree. It's yeah. like, I was like, you know, maybe I can drag him to the ground. Cause I sure as hell can't knock him to the ground. It's like, this guy's a big dude. But, um, anyway, I, um, Quite literally, in it, you know, in sort of like a last fling of desperation. Because I think I'm, I liked writing, but I didn't want to, you know, I'd been in team sports my whole life, and I was like, I'd like to work in, I'd like to work with a bunch of people creating something. And I, I just, you know, whether out of ignorance or arrogance or probably a combination of both, I went, I took an adult evening, like one of those free newspapers you get on the streets of any city, you know, Baltimore. 
this woman taught a introduction to acting class on the second floor of this building, you know, right up like five, six blocks north of where the bank was. And I took it in the first night. I just was like, wow, I want to do this, you know? And, and I took another class. It was like an on-camera class and people were like, you're so relaxed, you know, why you should try this. Like you could do this, you know, you, you could be good at this. And so I just made up my mind. I, I, I took another job as a, as a branch manager at a mortgage bank and I ended up in Dothan, Alabama. And, uh, you know, like literally, literally living in a cornfield in a friggin' trailer with a mouse. And I had, I mentioned I had four, three, four people working for me. They were going to close it down. They had one person there when I got there. And I said, I got to be able to hire people and to make loans. And, you know, ended up the office ended up doing really well. They offered me a really big office. They were like, you know, you're a big success. I'm like, I don't like this business. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> sold everything, sold this used French car I had that had no third gear. I remember I used to have to pop it from second to fourth gear. And, um, and I just went to New York. I had $2,000 in my pocket. It was 1985 and slept on the first week. I slept on the floor of, of a buddy of, of my sister's. And then uh, I met these two, one woman that I had gone to high school with and her roommate, and they rented me a room, a bedroom. And, and I met uh, Mike Rispoli and Michael and I ended up becoming roommates and we lived on 109th street, 144 West 109th street from 85 to 88. And I just was always in classes. You know, I started waitering, worked a couple, worked a door. I was a bartender. I was a cater waiter. You know, I did all the actor jobs and, you know, took classes and made sure that I was always in a class, you know, just trying to learn, entered a, tried out for, got into a two-year Meisner program and there was like movement and voice and diction and, and, you know, scene study. And I did a whole thing for two years and it was, you know, gave me my foundation and, and then, uh, you know, I was just trying to hustle. I was hustling commercials and industrial movies, like training movies for companies and learning about the camera and trying to get an agent, had a manager. The manager didn't really have any power to get me any, you know, play auditions or auditions for theater. But then I met an agent. She, uh, no, I, no, I went to a casting director, wonderful casting director, She's still in the business and she was casting a commercial and I just finished auditioning for her. And I said, I see that. I, I mean, I had heard in the lobby that you're auditioning for the glass menagerie that, um, at this regional theater in New Jersey at Fairley Dickinson. Okay. And, and um, I, I, I think I'd be good as a good gentleman, gentleman caller, you know, and, and she like, this is like after my audition, like between the time I finished and her going to the door with a room full of, she's behind schedule and there's like, you know, 15 actors waiting to come in. And I'm like, I said, can you, can you just, could I get an audition? Could you just give me a shot? And to her great credit, Judy Henderson, Judy looked at me, she looked me up and down. She goes, all right, I'll give you a shot. You know, my assistant will give you a time. And I got the gig and got me my equity card. And, um, you know, I started doing theater all over the country, you know, Ohio, Jersey, Massachusetts, you know, everywhere. And um, come back into town. That my whole thing was come back into town, book a few commercials, so that the residuals pay for my health insurance and I can live. And and then for the like, you know, the three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars to pay me a week to do theater, I, I can you know I can keep a roof over my head. Yeah. Do you remember going back like some of the commercials were they like big brands or like local around here, just like tri-state area commercials? No, nah, they were they were national. I mean, I I, I was a, I was the Stroh's beer guy for a while. I had this dog who would bury a beer truck, and what else? The dog ordered a he ordered a side of beef, a poodle, and a, and a case of Stroh's. When this is before Stroh's was, uh, I think Stroh's doesn't exist anymore. I, I, I know. I was gonna say I never heard of that before. Yeah, no. but Stroh's was a big brand out of Milwaukee really? for a while. So I did that. I did Miller. I did uh, I did what was the big? I got a. a Medicwell. I did a Medicwell commercial that ran for a long time. And, um, uh, Red Lobster. I remember I did a Red Lobster commercial, and I remember I remember that because they were laughing at me. They said, "You know, you should spit the lobster legs." Uh, they um, it was King Crab Claws. They said, "You should spit that out because we're going to do probably fifty to sixty takes." And I looked at the guy and he started laughing. I said, "Man, I grew up near the Chesapeake Bay. We we eat crab like you know, like p- other people eat crackers. Like I'm eating this stuff." <laughs> You know, you get to like the 24th take and you're like, okay, I'm spitting this stuff. <laughs> you know, right? 
<laughs> oh, that's great. But, you know, when you do in the old days, and it's funny to say that now, but, you know, working in front of a, a camera, you, you know, I, I learned how to hit a mark. I learned how to walk and talk and chew gum, you know, in front of a camera. I learned lighting. I learned how to behave on a set. Uh, I, I learned the protocol on the set of what a first DP, you know, what a first AD does versus a second AD. You know, why you want to make friends with the, not necessarily the DP, but definitely with the camera guy or, or gal and, and absolutely with the focus puller because you always want to be in focus. And you learn, you know, you just like by doing it, I mean, I ended up doing, you know, including regional commercials, probably 50 commercials and oh, wow. at least and a couple, you know, I don't know, dozen or two dozen training films. And you just learn a lot. And then it, it helped me for, you know, when I got a break and, got a movie of the week that took me out to uh, got the lead in a movie of the week that took me to LA and you know, my career changed, you know, overnight. So um, then people were like, you know, you, you already know how to do this stuff pretty well. You know, you're not just a stage actor who doesn't know anything. So, you know, a lot of that's just from taking whatever comes in front of you and not being picky. I, I, I didn't have room to be picky because, you know, I had friends in acting class who like mommy and daddy were paying their rent on the side. And I, that, that was not my case. I mean, I, yeah, I was on my own, man. So I was like, yeah, um, my parents don't have any money to sustain me. I got to hustle my own thing. So and I think that maybe that even helped you out even more, made you hungrier. And I think your background, you know, playing yeah. lacrosse, playing a team sport, especially at a high level. I don't know who the coach, I, I wouldn't know off the top of my head what the name of the John Hopkins coach was then. I'm sure he's a, I'm sure he's a legend. He is actually. He uh he's in the he was a he's in the coaches hall of fame. He's yeah, in, I would think. He's in the US Lacrosse Hall of Fame. He's uh he's considered he still holds the highest winning percentage of any uh coach in the history of Division One. I. I mean, you know, he when I left Hopkins, our record when I was a senior, our record record was like sixty one and four. Wow. You know, in four years we lost like four games. <laughs> You know, in 79, we were undefeated, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, I, the thing that that taught me is, you know, how to just keep your cool and keep your focus when you got thousands of people. Like in those days, a big crowd was at the national championship game was 20,000, you know, yeah. but even in a, like, in a big rivalry with like Maryland, we could get eight to 10 to 12,000 and, you know they hated us and we hated them. And there was always a, you know, all five years that I was there, there was always a fight with Maryland. We always had a fight. We always play them twice and we beat them every single time. And in my whole career there, we were 10 and 0 against the Terps and um, we hated those motherfuckers. <laughs> they hated us and you know, we didn't care. I, you know, it's funny now when we bump into each other, when I see the guys I used to play against, we were like hugging each other and like, remember the days we were trying to punch each other's lights out, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that translated, you know, you're on the, like you said, when you're on the set, I think some people that might not have that sports background, uh, might not think about knowing what everyone's job is. Especially when you're on a field, you know what this guy does, what he's doing. So that's the way teams work. So that, that's why you're able to learn so much on the fly. I just learned this word grok, G R O K. When you grok things, when you like tie everything together, you just grokked it. Yeah, it's that is true. true. No, it is true because uh, that's. I think w the word "grack" is from uh, Zen in the, in the art of mo you know motorcycle maintenance or something like that, or one of those books. But um, I think my wife has that book. I think you got that right. True. It's true because you know guys that you play with. If, if if you're playing to win and you're playing for competitively for a championship, no nobody anybody steps out of line. Everybody lets you know real quick. On a set, on any set, you got a hundred people in a crew. You got a hundred people, and everybody's got a, a, a critical job. And you, and you're just, you know. And I was a role player. I mean, and that in some ways that's even more important in the sense that I wasn't an all American. I was an all American in high school, but and I knew what it was to be a star because I was like the star guy in my senior year in high school. I was an all American. I was an all metro player, all county player, first team, you know. But then I go to college and the game is much faster and I'm playing with dudes who, you know, I play, I play with a half a dozen guys who are in the hall of fame who are like on a, an elite athletic level. You know, there's a real difference between being even be able to play ball D one, like all these basketball players. Now the guys on the bench, tell me, let me tell you something. Those guys can all play, Oh but yeah. The guys, but the guys who are the star players in those teams, they're at another level. They're just at another level and, and everybody knows it. And that's, 
that's the great thing about sports that is a true meritocracy. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. You can either play ball or you can't. Yeah. And that did translate to sets because, you know, and my father and his brothers are all former Marines. And, and the one thing they taught me was respect for everyone and everything that everyone does. And, you know, you don't walk around like your shit don't stink and you don't walk around like you put your underwear on any different from anybody else. You walk around asking people, how can I help you? Can I do something for you? I mean, you know, like, thanks for, and you, and you say thanks a lot because it's a big machine. Any set is a big machine. And to make the machine work right, you don't need any fucking divas. And yeah. I, don't, I don't like divas. I mean, I was laughing with a friend of mine. I did a Hallmark movie. I'm not going to say the actor because it doesn't matter anymore. And it's, it wouldn't be right anyway. But anyway, yeah. this guy kept showing up late to the set. And he had a, a role that was bigger than mine. I mean, he had a starring role. And I finally like knocked on his door and went in because the, the director was a writer, writer director was a friend of mine who had actually fought for this guy. And I knew he had fought. He had, Hallmark didn't want to hire this guy. Uh, he, had a, he had a bit of reputation. And he's a good actor, but he had a problem with the bottle, you know. So, I, you know, a guy opens his door and he goes, hey, what do you want? And he's a big guy. He's my size. You know, he's at least 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, and I, I said, I got to come up and talk to you. And I come up, I close the door and I said, you fucking ever show up late again on a set, I will fucking lay you out. You understand? And I said, you owe an apology. You owe an apology to this whole crew and to, and to my friend, you know, the director, who, I won't say his name, who, who fought for you. Who fought for you. You know, and by the end of it, the guy's crying. He goes, I know, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm like, I'm literally pounding my hand on his friggin' counter. And I, I said, don't you dare fucking apologize. You were warned the first time. Now you've done it twice. And we all sat around here for three hours. And by the way, now I got to come in on a Friday and shoot because they had to redo the schedule. And I just had to tell my wife that I had to cancel on a dinner that she had set up. And she's pissed at me. So now I'm pissed at you because there's this whole fucking domino effect. So, you know, just be, just be a fucking human being and show up and be a pro, you know? And so I, you know, the only reason I'm telling that story and I'm not bragging at all, I'm just telling that story because like my whole life came into that moment in the sense that every locker room I was ever in, everybody knows their job, everybody knows their role. And it did prepare me. It did prepare me for any kind of ensemble work. And I, I've always loved it when a group of people, a team, um, can either perform at a high level and succeed on an athletic field or on a stage or in front of uh, on a sound stage or in, in front of cameras that there's a kind of a high that I get when you kind of go, wow, that was a, that was a pretty good day. That was a good day. Everybody, that was cool. And that's a, it's a well-written story and it'll be, or it's really funny. And we really nailed some jokes and we really got it. You know, yeah. like when I worked on almost perfect, we knew if the camera guys and gals were laughing because they've seen everything. They're so, they're almost jaundiced. They're so leathery. Like they, nothing makes them laugh. But the writing on that show was so friggin' good yeah. that when we started chuckling, we were like, okay, we got something here, you know? So let's talk about that. And then we could just go back to other things. So ha do you remember, I'm sure you remember that. That was like a big deal. Landing yeah, that was a regular role. Yeah, that was my first series regular. Um, they couldn't find the guy. I know, I know they had read like 50, 60 guys. They had, wow. they, had, they had read guys like, and he was unknown at the time, but I know they had read John Slattery and, they had read, they read some big name guys and they like, um, I was put on tape in New York in those days when it was tape and, um, they, and I was in a play and the only day I could fly out and I had to do it secretly because the, we had already been warned because one of the people in our play, Dylan Baker had been hired by murder one and he had to leave the play and that director blew up and he ripped the whole cast. He said, nobody leaves this play because we're three weeks in. I can't replace anybody. Well, technically, under equity rules, you, you can give your notice because if you are given a higher paying job, you're allowed to leave because it, you're a freelance artist. And uh, so I flew out secretly on a Monday. I read for the writers. Then we got we all got in cars. Nancy Travis was, right, was doing a movie literally up on Mulholland Drive shooting an exterior. We go up and we all cram into this, you know, it wasn't a tiny trailer. It was, she, she was a, becoming a big star then. And, and they, it was a pretty good sized trailer, but you know, there's like 10 people crammed inside of her trailer watching the two of us read. And then they were like, okay, that went well, let's go over to CBS. Now 
I had landed at 10 in the morning and they had, and they, you know, we, I read for them, they bought me lunch. Then we went to see Nancy then we did that. And then they gave me like an hour or two hours off. Then at five o'clock in the afternoon, I read at CBS for the president of the network and a whole you know, room full of people. And um, they asked me to wait outside and then, and then they, they came out, the writers came out, they, they dismissed the other actors and, I thought I was, you know, going to leave. I didn't know why they weren't telling me to leave too. I had a plane to catch. I had to catch a, a, a red eye to get back in time for the Tuesday show. And, uh, I, I'm, and we were in previews and, and I, I got back and, and, the, and the president says, I look, he shakes my hand. He goes, I look forward to seeing you and Nancy for many years doing this. And he leaves and I, Peter Tortorici and I, I, it was before Moonvis and I, I looked at, I looked at Ken Levine and David Isaacs who were two of the writers and, Rob, and Robin Schiff who created it. And I said, what does he mean? He looks forward in. And Ken was like, you just got this, you just got the job dummy. And I said, well, he didn't say you got the job. He just said, I look forward to it. I, it's like code. Yeah. So we shot the, um, I had to leave the play and there was a lot of Hazara and guy the director was screaming at me and all this stuff. And I was like, man, I'm playing four little roles. You gotta be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah. And I uh, went out and the pilot went really well and the audience was roaring. And, and we were like, wow, this is like, and Nancy, I, I, to this day, I always say she's like, um, she's like a, a Lucy Arnaz, you know, she, she'll do any kind of physical comedy, you, you know, she used to like do Pratt Falls and, you know, she'll tumble over stuff. And she was, she was game for anything. And, um, and she just glowed. I mean, she was beautiful and funny and smart and, had real great instincts about script and, you know, um, you know, and they picked us up and, you know, and then that first season we did really well and CBS was in the toilet. They were number four in those days. And I think we were number out of a hundred in those days, there was only a hundred shows on. There was like, we were number 30, 31, 32, 28, 29, right around number 30 all the time. And we were the highest rated new show on CBS and literally, and literally the only, um, pilot that got picked up that was actually got a back end and then got a second season order um and so it, it was it was amazing and uh, but then Tortorici got fired Moombas came in and he said if you want that second season I want her to date other guys and get rid of the guy huh. he, was, he, he was in he was no doubt in my mind he, that was the days when Sybil Shepherd had her show called Sybil and it was in season five and gonna, it was dying and going to go off the air. And she was a blonde who dated a lot of different guys. And so Moonvis thought it was a great idea or else he was in love with Nancy, who knows these days with what's happened with him, you know, that he just wanted her to be single. And, yeah. you know, and Ken and Robin and David, like, they just like looked at him and said, that's not the show we created. Like we created Adam's Rip. We created Hepburn and Space, uh, Tracy and Hepburn. This is like a modern day Tracy and Hepburn. We don't, we don't know what to do. And he said, well, you know, she'll date different guys. And he said, and they were like, that's not the show. And he goes, well, what's going to happen to them? Are they going to get married? And they said, well, maybe eventually. But, you know, the, it was funny because Helen Hunt and, and Paul Reiser were having a great success with their show. And I was like, what is he talking about? Like, Reiser and Hunt are married and millions of people are tuning in every week to laugh at them. What? So I knew it was bullshit and everyone yeah. else knew it was bullshit. He just didn't, you, what, what, what really happens is when you come in as president of a network, you actually kill all the bastard children so that nobody can say, well, it was a predecessor who greenlit that show. Yeah. And that's why it's a success. You just kill whatever's left over. So that it's all on you and you're the hero and all that shit. It, that happens in everything. Even in like in sports, a new GM, sure. GM, like I'm a Giants fan. The new GM comes in. I'm going to get rid of every guy the previous guy got, even if it's the best player. That's right. OBJ. Yeah, I know. OBJ, man. Like, really? I know. You didn't really get much for him, huh? I it, it all depends on if they do something with the picks. But uh, so I watched that, the almost perfect. Like, I think most of them are on YouTube, and I watched the podcast yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. And it was really funny. <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> Good. <Yeah. laughs> you now, seem really comfortable, like, the way that – you and her work together, especially now that, you know, knowing your background and what you're doing, like to prepare for this. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. And you know, it's really funny. I never knew. I never saw the person that was the voice of Howard, the duck. Yeah. And it's so weird hearing 
Chip Zion talk. <laughs> that's all I did you see that movie did you see that movie I never yet? saw that movie but, oh okay but everybody used to tease Chip about how I the duck <laughs> I love Chip I love Chip I love them all I love them. yeah Matt, Matt's gotten a big career and I loved Clennon and they were really funny guys and I gotta tell you just for fun they're when they got when the writers really got into their groove believe me there's there's even funnier episodes on youtube than that pilot i mean oh, yeah really fun. she yeah. takes me there's an episode where she takes me to some zen retreat in the high desert where we can't eat or we can't speak and it's it's just fucking hysterical and the couple and you're not even supposed to touch and like the couple next door is like you know i like we're, we're like jumping around in our sleeping bags because it's freezing it's the high desert yeah. so you're freezing and like and I'm like, I can hear them in there. They're eating McDonald's, you know? It's like, it's hysterical stuff. And 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 then I said, now nah, they're boffing or whatever I was saying, boinking, you know? It's like, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, Mike's character's like, I want to go home and get a Philly cheesesteak for God's sake, you know? And she's like, no, Mike, we have to change our lives. And it's it's just classic, like, Hepburn Tracy stuff of, like, the girl going, no, come on, we can do this. It'll make us better human beings. And the guy's like, will you give me a hamburger for God's sake? <laughs> You know, so it's funny. And it was cool. That first episode was directed by Andy Ackerman, who's like a legend. Yeah, Ackerman. That guy's done so many. Like, I, it's like you watch Seinfeld. You see him on Seinfeld. Oh, sure, yeah. he directed Curb, you know, a ton of shows. Well, the reason, listen, and, first of all, Andy's a great guy. Yeah. Andy's got like four or five kids. You've never met a more regular guy in his life. He grew up on the beach in California. He's just a regular, humble beach guy. He's like a surfer dude. Yeah. Um, really smart knows he knows how to fix scripts he knows how to get humor out of a moment that doesn't like is not really funny yet but he sees he sees the way into the humor and that's why everybody uses him i mean that's yeah. why that's why he he and, and, a, and a handful he and a handful of other directors are truly the gold standard in, in television comedy yeah and, and you know and he also has this like totally cool laid back, doesn't ever yell, comes over, might whisper something in your ear, kind of cool dude. And, and he's happy. He's always smiling, Andy. And, and um, I got to do a guest star on uh, adventure, uh, New Adventures of Old Christine. And my wife, Jordan, played Mrs. Belt. So she did like half a dozen episodes of that. Oh, wow. And I used to go watch her during her filming. And, uh, and Ackerman did all these things. So, I mean, I used to see Andy a lot. And he's just a great dude. I mean, he... he he deserves everything he gets because he's he's truly that talented. I know he did a lot of Frasier. Did yep. he? Did he? Did he do the episode that you were on? No, he, uh, you'll laugh about this though. But you know who did? Huh. Uh, Ken Levine, who was one of the writer, executive producers, creators of Almost Perfect. Oh wow! He segued. He segued into directing, and he directed that episode. Roz and the Schnoz. Oh look at that! That's a. It, you know what's it, funny? I never watched it, Frasier growing up. I never yeah. watched it. So it's on Netflix now, and. I said to my wife, because she said she used to watch it, and I mentioned, I was like, oh, you know, the guy Kevin I'm interviewing, he was in Raj and the Schnoz, and she's like, oh, I remember that. So I watched that clip, and then I started watching it, and that yeah. show, right from the, it's rare for these shows, right from Jump, right in the first scene, first episode, phenomenal. Well, the timing is just great. We finished that. They did over over 200 episodes over yeah, it's seven years. Wild. And, and David and Kelsey and John Mahoney, they all told us, they said, when we finished that episode, they, they just turned to us. And Jordan and I know David a little bit. I mean, well, whenever we see him in New York, we, we sat, sit there and chat with him because, you know, we're just, you know, he's very sweet and, 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 and very nice guy and, and a smart, smart, smart guy. And he, he always says to us, he goes, that was truly one of the five funniest of the 200 we did. He goes, that, that episode was unbelievable people were literally peeing, peeing their pants in the stands they were laughing so hard and you can look if you look really closely he can't say a straight keep a straight face and oh, I know. my wife when he says um, oh what kind of dogs do you have and she says we have two giant schnauzers. <laughs> i mean i you know I, two years after that episode kelsey was an executive producer on some failed pilot that ultimately failed but I was coming in to read for him in his office at Paramount. And I come in the door. I haven't, I don't know who this guy, I mean, you know, I, I, I worked with him that one time. I mean, I, I didn't ever bump into him anywhere. 
So I hadn't seen him in two years. I walk in the door and I'm two feet in the door and he looks at me and he goes, oh, you're the one with the wife who couldn't keep the straight face. I was like, I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> you know? And again, he like looked at my nose at the table read and he went, they really don't have to do much work, do they? And I said, no, no they don't, Kelsey. I said, my nose is right in the room. That's, my nose is usually the first thing in any room. So yeah. okay, what are you going to do? How long do you remember how long it took to do that shoot? Like, was there a lot of retakes because they were just losing it? No, no. We, we, no, we did the typical thing that you do in a half hour. You rehearse for four days. Oh, awesome. And then you do it in front of two live audiences. They have, um, uh, well, maybe that one was actually one live audience. It, it, like, like in the days, like the first thing I ever did, the first guest star I ever did was the Cosby show. And you would do it at four o'clock from four to like five thirty six. You would have a dinner break. And then a different audience would come in and you would do it again from like 7.30 to whenever because they would even send the audience home from the second one and you would do what's called punch up, you know, where they would, they would just, the writers would throw different lines at you and they would do you a close up and, you, you know, because they're going to they're gonna test those lines to see which one gets the biggest laugh. Um, and then like with Almost Perfect and same with Frasier, I think we would just do one and we keep the one audience and then at 11, you know, by like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, you'd send them home and you do punch up for, you know, the shows that are not doing well, will do punch up till two, three in the morning. Cause they're just scrambling. But, but we, I was, you know, knock wood, both almost perfect and Frazier, you'd be done by 11, 1130. Cause, cause those guys, those men and women really knew what they were doing. Those writers. And you knew you had it, you knew you had it, you know, but Levine ended up directing that. So it was kind of like a, you know, it was a small world there for a while. And, and then Ken got out of the business and he, he's, he was a baseball announcer. He was the radio guy for um, Seattle and San Diego. And oh, wow. One season for Baltimore and then he, LA Dodgers and David Isaacs ended up teaching, I think at UCLA teaching comedy writing and Robin Schiff, I think still is in the business and still trying to produce. But uh, it was sad because, um, Ken and David told me this story. I bumped into him years later and we had a lunch together and he said, you know, they said, we're going to tell you, we're going to tell you a story. It won't mean anything to you because uh, two years after the show was canceled, the second season, we had to get rid of, you know, the first episode of the second season, they, they got rid of me and then they had only shot seven before it was canceled. And they only aired like three in the second season because the ratings went in the toilet and yeah. everybody knew they would because Everybody was tuning in to watch the chemistry between me and Nancy. You know, I mean, that, that was the show, really, the heart and soul. Of the oh, show. yeah. And he said, uh, Levine and Isaacs were a writing team. They had met each other in the Army, and they used to say, you know, we've known each other, and we've, you know, we've been writing partners longer than we've been married to our wives. And um, they go into this executive room at CBS, and Moonves is sitting at the other end, and the whole room is empty, and he's, and he's got lunch ordered for him. He, goes, he said, we, we were no sooner in the door walking over to the table, and he's like, almost perfect. The worst decision I ever made. And Levine said he just wanted to strangle him. He was like, you know, like, fuck you, pal. You know, that's all you got to say for killing a great show. Because, you know, as Ken said to me and David, too, they said, they said, what's arrogant and funny about these presidents of these networks is they think that it, they think that you can just snap your fingers and come up with a great idea. They have no idea that, it, that David and I had waited a lifetime. They had done their training on MASH. They had ended up running um, Cheers. They worked on Cheers for four years and, and, and season the fourth year they were there, they ran the writer's room. They worked their way up. They slogged their way up. They had a couple other failed pilots. And, then, and Ken said to me, you know, through, through you know, tears in his eyes, he said, the greatest idea we ever had was almost perfect and this fucking moron killed it. You know? Okay. So, you know, but that's, look, that's no different from, you know, there've been a lot of stupid decisions in Hollywood and yeah, yeah. God knows almost perfect. is just one of many. Yeah. Good ideas that somebody didn't have the balls to finish on, you know, whatever. I'm sure there's some other uh, things in between movie roles and TV shows, but then like right after that uh, you were in home alone three. Yeah. I, I, this is a weird thing. I, I, I think I had, I was, I must, I know I was on some list and, and I, I had never worked over at, at Fox and um, I was quite literally, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I auditioned. It was just, really? a, it was a straight offer. And um, 
But I was, I knew where I was because I was on the other side of the world. I was in Bhutan. I had done a Hallmark uh, uh, Hall of Fame movie with a very unknown Naomi Watts. Wow. And James Earl Jones and Ellen Burstyn called Time Peace. And Ellen had told me while we were filming in North Carolina, she said, I'm going to Bhutan with Dr. Robert Thurman, Uma Thurman's dad. She's an amazing, he's a, he speaks Tibetan. He speaks six languages. He's a professor at Columbia. And he's an amazing, like incredible savant. You know, he can tell you everything about Tibet and Bhutan and, you know, and he's taken a group of 16 people. Well, I said, well, I'm going on that trip. And she's like, it's been sold out for two years. And I called the guy who's the head of the trip with, some company in San Francisco, I remember. And I said, uh, man, I'll sleep on the ground. I'm like, I'll ride on top of the bus. I don't care. Yeah. Like, and I kept calling him every other day. And he's like, I'm telling you, the thing's sold out. And then somebody got sick. And, um, and he said, you've been so, you know, such a pest. I'm going to let you come. And um, I was in Bhutan. And I literally got a cable in those days when you could get like a, you know, like literally like a cable came through that said, you need to call your agent in LA. And I was laughing going, how the frig did they find me in Bhutan? Man, that's like crazy. And they, um, and Ellen had wanted me, um, she was going on, I'll never forget. She was going on to Cambodia because to see Angkor Wat, to see the hidden city. And then she was going to Bali and she goes, just, 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 you know, just tag along with me. She goes, I'll show you we're going to, you know, I got things set up and you'll see things you, you'll never, you'll never forget for the rest of your life. And I get this call, you have to come back like immediately and you need to fly into LA and you will be in LA for less than 24 hours and you're going to fly you directly to Chicago and you're going to start filming. So in my head, I kind of went either somebody dropped out or they couldn't sign someone and they couldn't close the money on someone. And I, as most actors are, I was like, I'm somewhere down the list. They went, oh, Kilner, he'll take that. He'll take the money. <laughs> and, uh, but I was flattered because I loved the original Home Alones. And when I read it, I thought it was actually a really funny concept. And I remember that I thought that Home Alone 2 kind of sucked. Yeah. I still think that the original is the best one. But I thought ours was number two. I thought ours was really funny and, uh, yeah. and, and worked. And, and um, um, you know, I, got, I met all those guys. Those were all New York actors who did the, uh, including Marion Seldes, who did the uh, Cranky Neighbor, but also, um, Oh God, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, Rasha Draka. No, not Rasha. What was the guy who was the leader of the international? Oh yeah. I forget his name. He, he, you see him in movies all day. He's a great guy. Yeah. And I, I hung out with him and, 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 um, David, what's his name is married to Cindy Lauper. You know, he was fantastically funny. And I kept saying to him, I want one to be one of your roles. I want my hair burned and singed and, you know, I'm going to fall into a bucket of goo. I think that would be fun. But, uh, but I was just happy to be the dad, you know, and even though the dad's kind of not there. <laughs> now, was John Hughes involved in it? Like, was he on set the whole time? He was not on set the whole time. Okay. Um, you know, he did make an appearance. And, okay. Um, and he had approval. Obviously, he had approval over everything. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the vast majority of the time he wasn't there. And, uh, yeah, I, I, he was just a big producer on it, I think, mostly. Yeah. I, I think the reason why I really always enjoyed the third one was the first one. Like you said, it's the original story. This is like, well, you asked me in the beginning, like what's the whole like concept of this project about the second movie. It was basically the same thing. Like you had these two grown, again, it's a comedy film, but you have these two grown men that have this vendetta against the kid. And it just so happens to be in New York this time, you know, throw in Donald Trump and all that. And, Blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing, Central Park. But in the third one, it was and essentially with John Hughes write, writing it again. You don't see that too often, like somebody that's continually there. Yeah. And boom, it like took it up a notch. It wasn't just two, you know, two little guys that are just robbing people for jewelry. It was like a big deal. <laughs> yeah, no, he he did, and and you know. I, I feel really bad about John's early demise and his death because yeah. um, he, you know, I, I, I think you know he was really good at what he did. I mean, people, it's hard to contextualize things now, but I mean, I mean, he was the ruler of family comedy for a while. Oh yeah, he was the peak of the friggin' mountain man, 
and everything from Pretty in Pink to like, you know, he knew the teen movies, the Breakfast Club, all that stuff, man. He, he was like, and um, he just knew funny and he, but, but more importantly, I thought he, he, he did funny along with actually reached into like real relationship about weight, the way teenagers deal with each other and, you know, families deal with each other in a fun way. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just sort of heartbreaking. He's still not with us. And, uh, he, he, he deserves every, every accolade or kudo that he gets because he was really great. Huge. Yeah. Every movie he nails just what you're, what you're watching and gets you emotion. Like you're watching a comedy to kind of escape and yeah. laugh and, and he, yeah. And then you had the opportunity, you're on movie, your onset wife was from 16 candles. I know. I mean, <laughs> and she, you know, she was great. I mean, she, first of all, she's a great actress. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and she's just a good person. And, and, uh, um, so I, you know, yeah, I, I was like, and you know, I, I as I said to her, you know, it, this, is, this is basically, you know, she's more of the lead than I was. Cause I, I forgot, I was like in an airport snowed in somewhere or something like yeah. that. Um, but it was, you know, it was a good group and we all got along and I remember it was a bitterly, bitterly, we shot from, got there in late November and we finished, or I finished in February. I think they may have finished the first week of March and it was a, you know, three month, four month shoot. And it was just like ugh, freezing freaking cold. I remember Jordan and I, we weren't married at the time. We tried to go out of our hotel room in downtown Chicago, and I'm not kidding you. We tried to walk two blocks to a steakhouse. We were bent over at a 45 degree angle. The wind was blowing so hard, and it was so cold. The tears were streaming out of our eyes. And I just looked at her, and I said, "You know, I, I don't." I remember saying to her inside the hotel room, "Our windows had had like frozen like an ice cube, so you couldn't see out. Like it was literally like, oh my god, it's so cold that they the wind there's frost on a hotel windows, you know." Yeah but don't even open. And, and I remember saying to her, it was so painful. I said, you want to go back and order room service? And she's like, yes, let's go back. So when you're, when you're, this is a great, it's great that you brought that up. So when you are signing up for a movie and they say, you know, your agent says, Hey, you're going to be in this. Is there like a set amount of days that your contract's for, or you're in it for the long haul? Like no matter as long as it takes. Haviland, Haviland Morris. I couldn't remember. Haviland, yeah, okay. Haviland. Um, uh, in the case of having a lead in a movie like that with a, a studio budget behind it, yeah. they have you for the duration. Oh, they're okay. going to tell you, they will negotiate saying, you know, the total of days you're going to shoot are going to be these days. But everything is subject because schedules change all the time. People yeah. get sick, people get hurt. They have to flip the whole schedule. So you have to be available, but they'll say like, you know, and I'm no expert. I mean, you should talk to a professional agent about this, but they'll say like <laughs> shoot is three months. Kevin will be working approximately 12 to 14 days. We want to pay him blah, blah, blah. Those 12 to 14 days will happen over the course of can happen anytime during the shoot, but will likely happen okay. over the course of three or four weeks of, of the 12 weeks. You know what I mean? Type of, that's with a studio picture with the indie film. Most of the time, my experience is most indie films are shooting in four to five weeks. You can yeah. sometimes shoot an indie film in three weeks and you're really, I mean, man, you're working like lightning. You work like as fast as television. And, um, and then they just have you for the whole, the, the, the whole time. And, you know, you're, you know, some indie, I've worked, <laughs> I've done every contract you can imagine. I've fallen in love with scripts and done waiver. I've done ultra low budget. I've done low budget. I've done, you know, modified low budget. I think there sag after has four independent film contracts and, you know, they just, they, they created those cause they wanted young filmmakers to, and it was a smart idea, you know, to, to help them make their movies. But, you know, I, you work for an independent film and you can be working for, I've worked for as little as $125 a day. I, I did a, a waiver film where I just did it. I volunteered. I, sometimes you only get 500 a week on a way on an indie film. You know, it's like working on stage. Yeah. And oftentimes in any indie film, if you see me, whatever clothes you see me in, that's out of my friggin' closet. And that's most actors, you know, because they don't even have a budget for wardrobe. So they're just saying, you know, he, this is how I dress. Can you bring, you know, can you bring half your closet and we'll choose a few things. And, you know, it, it's always a, a, a passion project for me. It's with an, with, with an independent film where there's no real money. 
I just say to myself, I, I really like this script. I, I like this director. I'd like to do this. That's you awesome. Know, um, so you just make it happen. And it's like similar, like to doing 99 seat waiver theater in LA where, you know, you're going out and finding your own props and you're using your own wardrobe and, you know, everybody knows that they're just doing it because they love storytelling. Yeah. And you're, and you know, it's like anything else in life. You know, either, if you really love it, you know, you, you'd almost you don't tell anybody, but you'd, you'd, <laughs> almost, you'd almost do it for next to nothing. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. We love doing, and I love storytelling. And I always, I used to play this game with myself. Like if I was in a horrible accident and my face went through the windshield, and I, you know, I looked like Zipperhead the rest of my life. What would I do? And I thought, you know, I would still be in the storytelling business. I'd become a producer, a writer. You know, maybe I'd become a, a camera operator. I don't know. I mean, I, I like, I like being in the storytelling business. So. That's great. It's funny you say that. I just watched an interview about with Michael Jordan er, early on. It must have been just before the uh, the first repeat. He was getting interviewed about basketball, and I can't even imagine what they were getting paid last uh, around that time. Towards you know what like Jordan would be worth today. It'd be like unbelievable money wise. But he was talking about I play the game not for the money. He's like, even if I didn't get paid, I would still be playing basketball. And he just looks so serious. And if you look the way he played, he he did that. He, he he gave it all, no matter what. Well, it you know, it, when you I, I, I say this to young actors all the time, and you know, because I there's a story I tell all the time whenever I'm because I'm getting more and more into teaching, and my wife is too. Yeah, cool. When I teach young actors, I just say to them, you know, my Meisner class, which was a two, it was a commitment for two years and there were only 16 of us. And, you know, you had to be interviewed and, you know, she had to offer you a position and, and you knew that you, when you committed, you knew you were committing for two years and it was three times a week and four hour classes. And, you know, you, you show up, you, if you don't show up, she'll, you know, they ask you to leave. Well, the first night, Catherine uh, Gately, who's now Professor Catherine Gately, she said, turned to us, she said, I want you to look at everybody and look on either side of you. Look at the person to your left. Look at the person to your right. Look behind you. Look at everyone. In five years, half of you won't be acting, and that'll be okay because the study of acting is the study of what it means to be a human being, so you'll be better human beings. So whatever it is you're meant to do in this world and in this life, you'll just be better at it. In 10 years, if I'm really lucky, Three of you, of the three of the 16, will still be doing it. Two of you will have support jobs full time. And if I'm really, really lucky, one of you, one of the 16 will be making a living at it. And I'm here to tell you, it's my understanding from my class, I'm the only one who wow. made a living at it. And she was 100% accurate. And I think it's good that way in the sense that, you know, and I'm not saying because it's just, Sometimes you find the thing you're meant to do. That's that's where I'm getting back to the Michael Jordan thing. Yeah, it, you find that thing where you're supposed to to do that. You know, you do it. You just you just you just do it. You find a way to do it. And the people that end up staying in something 30, 40, 50 years, their lifetime. You know, I'm in my I'm start. I've started my 35th year. I just finished wow. 34 years in February. I mean, to think that I've spent my whole life as a professional actor. It's it's mind-boggling i mean i know the statistics because i served four years in the national boardroom at sag and that you know just having a career this long where i've done nothing but act puts me in the top one percent two percent and that's humbling because there's 125,000 members 125,000 people that hold a sag after card and only about 12 which is a big you know like don't tell people this but really only 12 to 14 make a living at it that's twelve to 14,000 people in the entire 330 million people in this country who make a living at it. And, and, it, and I'm here to tell you, every year is a nail biter. Every year it's hard. And every year you got like, I don't know how we're going to pay that bill. But I'm too old to do anything else now. And, I, and more importantly, I still love storytelling too much. And it is what it is. And I'm sure that's what Jordan, what Jordan, what that look you saw in Jordan's eye, I was, I'm sure that was all encompassed in that look. Oh, yeah. I, in fact, I know it was, you know, and it's no different than when, you know, like I, for some weird reason, I'm kind of like, I, I admire people that blow glass, like glass blowers, like yeah, yeah. and stuff. I look at those dudes like, you're not making 
a shitload of money, but man, the beauty that they make. And you have to be deeply into it. That stuff, you can get severely burned. I mean, it's, it's hard work, you know. You don't do that unless you have a passion for it. Give me a break. You know, you, we, I'm going to play around at blowing glass. I don't think so, you know. We you stopped might. at one of those places one time. We were coming back from uh, getting our marriage license, and we got married in Canada. So on our way back, we stopped at one of those places, and we were probably still – we were in the front row, and we were probably still a good, like, 20, 25 feet from the people. And yeah. You could feel the heat on your face. So Yeah. They're yeah. – <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like anything else in life, it, you know, it's, it's funny. We all, you know, we in America, we always focus on our stars and whatever they are. It's like now the NCAA tournament's going on and we're, we're focused on those, you know, coaches who make seven figures. And I know. But, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of coaches making, you know, 60, 50, 40, 70,000 a year coaching in Division three, And, you know, and, and don't tell me they're doing it just because it's a job. I mean, they do it because they love it, you know I mean? You either got it or you don't. You either have a passion for it or you don't. That's yeah. It. You just got to trial and error. Because people will find out, especially players or whatever you're doing, people will yeah. find out that you're not there for the real reasons, and then you'll be out pretty quick. Well, most importantly, if you're being honest with yourself, you'll find out first. Oh, yeah. You, you, can, you, can, you can't really fool yourself. Yeah. As like, and, and, I, and, you know, there have been t- – I mean, I know at least three times in my career where I literally went – I was about 10 years in the – first time and I went up to Columbia I was living in New York I went up to Columbia University and I got the master's packet for filling out the all the the application for getting a master's degree in English literature because I was like I'm gonna go be a teacher because I plateaued and I don't want to just be a guest star on TV shows and this sucks and I hate being on the road as much as I am in regional theater I mean I, I love the plays but you know I'm never sleeping in my own bed and I'm a single guy and I can't seem to find, you know, I mean, I was dating different women, but you know, like everybody wants you to be established. And I was like, ah, so yeah, there are those times when I, you know, you, I doubted and, you know, thought, you know, maybe I would be better. My mom was a teacher and she always thought I'd be a good teacher. And, you know, maybe I should be teaching, you know, it's like, that's, that's human, you know, but um, every time I would try to get out, I got a, I got a bit of a break. I caught a little break put a little wind in my sails and, and then it just went on and now I'm too old to do anything else. And so, now you're you know, 25 years ago from that moment, you're teaching. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. To, it's interesting to be teaching, uh, you know, acting. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, but I also think that whatever it is you do, if you do it for over a quarter of a century and you have some wisdom or knowledge or not even the wisdom or not, let's just say you have experience. I think it's, I feel like it's almost your duty to pass that experience on to younger people. I mean, you know, why would you just keep that to yourself? Like, you know, help them out, help them so they don't make the same dumb mistakes that I made, you know? No, that makes a lot of sense. We, we have a newborn daughter and I think about that all the time. Like all these things that my parents could have said, Hey, don't do this or pay attention to this and all this. Oh, oh they made those mistakes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Congrats <laughs> on your daughter. That's oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. So yeah, a few more things and thanks so much for taking the time. Oh, so, no, no. so that scene in American Pie 2. Okay. That is like such a classic and you're on air for I I, I don't know exactly how many seconds, but it is such a, it's <laughs> such a great scene. Okay, so there's a funny story to that. All right. Uh, but it, so JB Rogers had been the assistant. He was the first AD, actually he was the first AD on two uh, television movies of the week that I had done. And JB's a great guy. He's just a down to earth guy too. I mean, you know, he's just like, let's go have a beer kind of guy, which is my kind of guy, you know, he called me up and, um, he said, Kev, I, I, I caught a break. I'm doing, I'm, I, I'm directing American pie too. And I said, that's great, man. Congrats. And he says, listen, uh, he goes, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed. I wish I could be, you know, but it's like teenagers. There's no real role for you, but there's a role for a dad. And all it says literally is goofy dad barbecuing in the backyard. And he said, I, I, I literally can only, they only have money, enough money for a day rate. And I, I, I just said, JB, I'm in, man. What do you, what do you want? He goes, well, he goes, it's not even really written. You'd have to improvise it. And I go, that's fine. We'll figure something out. That's cool. And we did it on, I'll never forget, we did it on a Saturday. And, uh, you know, he said to me, he goes, look, you're listening to these two 
women who are like th- these guys, they're going to make them strip. And, you know, and it's, and so I said, well, you know, what if he's getting off? And, and JP's like, he goes, okay, cap. He goes, yeah, you're, I, I get it. He goes, how far you want to go with this? And he, he goes, he goes, I can't have you with your hand down your pants. I said, no, no, I'm not talking that. I said, he just should be like getting like, he, I'll make him like, kind of like he's a square dude who like gets as aroused as the guys are by being you know, like, you know, and so we just tried some stuff, you know, and, and, and the whole thing, like we, we, you know, and we were literally done within three or four hours. It didn't even take the whole, you know, it was like literally they had to move on. It was, it might've even been two hours. I forget. And, um, he was very happy. He said, we, that is funny. He goes, I, and I said, and I was like, you sure? Because I always think, you know, I'd rather do another two or three takes. And, you know, and he was like, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. We don't have to do anything more. I'm telling you right now, Kev, it's funny. He, they paid me, I'll never forget. They paid me $750, $850 for the day. Well, the movie made like 230, 220 million. I don't even know what it made. It made, it definitely went over 200. Oh yeah. Million. And in those days, I mean, today that would be like 400 million, yeah. right? I have made probably somewhere in the range of 20 to $30,000 in producers <laughs> off that movie for working three hours and improvising a scene that really wasn't even on the page. And, and that is like the best, as I said to my wife, there's never been a better job in my life than being an American Pie 2. Because wow. I have more people, more kids who now are young adults who come up to me and go, that fucking scene makes me laugh so hard. Yeah. No, that, so, that part's awesome. Yeah. It was just fun. It was just a goof, man. It was a goof. And, and that's like catching lightning in a bottle too. And JB was great. And I was grateful for him for, you know, and he was like, no man, you were always a great guy to work with. And you know, because I knew you could come up with something. So it was cool. That was cool that you're able to come up with it. And then it was that successful. So not only well, did yeah, you like play the, the role, thing. but that's not the, that's the thing you, that, you know, believe me. I, I, and I really, I'm only want to emphasize this because you don't know. Yeah. What's going on. So that's why I was saying to him, can I do a, two or three more takes? Cause I wasn't quite fully certain of what I had given him. Yeah. And yet, you know, the pecking order on a set is the director's the boss. And if the director says I'm happy and we got to move on, yeah. you, you don't fight it too much. Cause he's the boss. She's the boss, whatever. Yeah. And, um, but it wasn't until it came out until you see how it's edited and cut together. Like, I think, I think there's a, the, you see me and with the kids and then it cuts away to them and then it cuts back to me and his edits were so tight and sharp that it really, be, it built, it would build and, and you know, it got little, it got, you know, you could see it coming and yeah. you're like, Oh my God, this is funny. You know? And so that's why everybody laughs so hard. So that, you know, but if you get a shitty editor or, you know, director didn't quite know what he or she wanted and didn't quite really get it. And then you don't know, then it doesn't become a success. Then you kind of go, ah, it, it, we missed that opportunity. And I've, I've done lots of films where I, I felt like, you know, you left and you went, ah, I should have thought of that other thing. That would have made that scene pop. Or yeah. I should like, if you're improvising a line, especially like in the world of comedy, they'll say, can you give it a button? And, and you, you know, you try and come up with lines, but like technically, I mean, I'm not a writer. I, 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 I have a bit of a goofy head so I can think of funny stuff at times, but, there's times I've definitely not come up with the funniest thing idea and it, it, it sort of is languished and didn't really quite work. So you don't always hit a home run, but I think in American Pie 2, it just happened to work perfectly. So Yeah, when you're just, ha- when you're just holding, because you start off grilling and then it gets picked up by those walkie-talkies and you're just like on that table by yourself. <laughs> you're like, I'm not hungry. <laughs> yeah, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. You take care of the kids. <laughs> you know, I, we did one take. I'll never forget. We did one take. And it's, I think Jimmy, and I don't know if it ended up in the movie. It's been so long since I've seen it where I was like taking the phone and like rubbing my nipple with it. And, 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 and JP was like, Kevin, what are you? I said, well, I said, you're laughing. And he goes, yeah, I'm laughing, but it's weird. And I said, yeah, okay, it's a little too, you know, so I tried all sorts of stuff. And, you know, what ended up, whatever ended up on the screen is what he chose. But, you know, we tried lots of things. So. That's awesome. All right. So I have three more questions. Yeah, sure. And then I'll let you go. Big time. So over the years, what was, uh, because you, you had the opportunity to be on a lot of, uh, have some guest roles. Yep. Obviously, we talked about Frasier, you're on Cosby Show. Is there any other, other ones that when you were on it, you were kind of, I don't know, starstruck and you're like, wow, I'm really doing this? Like you're on Murder, She Wrote which was like a classic 
show that ran forever. I was, I was, I, I don't think I've ever been more humble. It's funny you bring that up because on Murder, She Wrote, I was, I was humbled because uh, Angela asked for me to come back. I had done a guest star in the prior season. Oh, totally, wow. Totally different role. And when they call, when my agent called and said, you know, she'd like you to come back and do a different role. I said, really? Because like that never, I mean, aren't audiences going to remember me? And, and he said, no, Angela loves you. She likes you a lot. She'd love you. She'd like your energy on the set and, you know and i thanked her profusely because that's 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 i just i'm humbled by that you know like, yeah i still think of myself as just being a big goof so you know i uh, you know that's just really nice um uh the closer you know that up that that guest star was that was hard that that was a, you know my son and that was had a cancer and the kid I remember, you know, working with that group and, and uh, Kira Sedgwick is just such a phenomenal actor. And she was winning, she was up for the Emmy every year. She's a fantastic actor. Yeah. And she was incredibly um, generous and complimentary in her words to me. And so was the director and executive producer, you know, that was a, was a tough role and was with a lot of really, you know, great actors, um, you know, on that. So I loved, I loved doing that one. You know, um, I was amazed at the success of, uh, you know, of House of Cards, and and I was grateful to do that 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 role. I it was disappointment to me. I had read three times for the president and twice for the role I ended up getting, and um, you know, I wish I because I knew the president. I knew the president would you know go into season two. So I, and I knew my character might disappear, which he did. And, and, and I think he reappeared. Uh, I think it was in the last episode of season three, but, um, you know, to, to work with a director of that caliber, I mean, he's just, he's off the charts, you know? And, uh, it was, but it was a tense set, you know, Spacey, Spacey was a perfectionist and, you know, he didn't make, he didn't make the hat the set wasn't necessarily happy. It was just a functionary kind of like professional do things. Everybody was very, very tense. Cause it was, again, this is where context is really, really important. You know, this is a hundred million dollar gamble by a very unknown Netflix at the time. Yeah. But that room, that table read, all those actors, you know, those actors are all like actors, actors from New York theater and, and, great actors like really in you know in small supporting roles but but you know every single actor i mean people like reed bernie and and um you know people like uh you know michael kelly was just blowing up then and 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 uh, jane atkinson's a great great stage actor you know mahershal ali was in that i met mahershala then i mean now he's become a superstar yeah um, I mean, it was like the who's, you know, Boris MacGyver. I'm looking at some of these guys now because I'm forgetting who was in it. Um, but, um, oh, God, Larry Pine is a, a well-known New York actor. Sakina Jaffrey, Sakina blew up. I mean, Sakina became huge. Constance Zimmer. I mean, Constance Zimmer. Yeah. You know, these are really, these are like top shelf actors, you know. And um, and so, um you know, it was, it was, um, it was an, it was an honor to, to, to do that show. And, uh, you know, Fincher, Fincher was a, and Fincher still is, he's a perfectionist, you know, he's just a perfectionist. Yeah. Well, that was cool, you know, in a different way because the writing was so good that we like, we all knew it was going to be really good. Um, and I remember sitting in Lincoln center at the red carpet night, um, where they did the first two episodes as a, like a two hour movie. Um, and you could hear you know, people were roaring and standing up and cheering and, you know, at the end. Um, and we knew we had something, you know, or, or I, I knew they had something I should say, you know, I yeah. know it wasn't probably going to be part of it, but um, whatever. That was cool. That was That's great. Really cool. Um, trying to think of, uh, it's weird over a long career to think of, um, of like things that stick out. It's like, there's, 
little things like even on junk, what I call junk TV. I mean, I did an episode of a series where I got to see the great Jonathan Winters at work. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, and share, and I didn't have any scenes with Jonathan, but, um, but we were on stage at the same time. And I, I, you know, I was in awe of him. I mean, I watched him during a rehearsal have everybody crying. They were laughing so hard where he just did improvisation for over 30 minutes, wow. 40 minutes. And, and, you know, you, someone who's that such a huge superstar, um, trying to think of who else has really stuck in my brain. Well, you worked with Scarlett Johansson when she was really young. Yeah. Scarlett was, Scarlett was 14. I know. And, and she'd just done Manny and Mo, which is a guy, which had was going to Sundance. I think it was, it went to Sundance and she got, she got really noticed by doing Manny and Mo, but she, this was the thing. And I remember she was there with her mom and, you know, she was just like, she had those like lips and she had, she already had this like face where you were just like, Oh my God, this girl's like, I, I remember saying to her mother, I hope you have a baseball bat with a big nail in it because you're going to have to beat them off. You know, like she's a really pretty girl. And she was very sweet and very, 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 you know, just down to friggin' earth. You know, yeah. there was nothing, uh, there was no attitude and she's all about the work and, and she's still, from what I hear, is still quite like that. Um, that was super cool. Um, trying to think of who else. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, You know, I, it was funny. I, I did a, it was a fun, it wasn't fun, but it was a really interesting role to do on Life, the smoothest cop show called Life. But I got to work with Damian Lewis and he was really interesting, really good guy. He's in billions now. And, um, you know, I thought it, that was, I, I liked doing that. I loved working on Damages. You know, that's a really great uh, oh, yeah. series. And uh, I got to have scenes with Rose Byrne and she was, I sat down across from Rose the first time and she has these, like she doesn't pluck her eyebrows. They're just like these great bushy and she's so beautiful and she's very down to earth. And I just looked at her and I was looking at her eyebrows and I said, I said, you have the most beautiful eyebrows I've ever seen in my life in a woman. And she burst out laughing. She said, have we even met? And I said, Oh no, I'm Kevin. How are you? It's like, <laughs> they just look like these, Beautiful, like these perfect, like, you know, like, what would you say? They were just so like caterpillars or something. Yeah. Perfectly beautiful. And she, I, I was doing the scene with her and it was like, you know, I, I took everything in my focus because she's just one of these, I think she's like stunningly beautiful and stunningly talented. You know, if a woman's just beautiful, an actress is just beautiful and she doesn't have real talent. You know, it doesn't turn me on or it doesn't get me excited. I shouldn't say turned on, but it gets, doesn't get me excited. Yeah. When you're as talented as Rose is and as beautiful as she is, then I'm like, wow, this is cool. This is like cool. I like that. Um, and really smart. She's so smart. Um, I had so much fun doing Ugly Betty. They were, they were a great group. Very loose. Very, very fun. Um, good show really well written and, and tight. And um, I told you about new adventures of old Christine and. Um, How about tales from the crypt? So that was really cool. Um, it was really cool because Kim was four months, three and a half, four months pregnant. And they had to shoot her mostly. They had to, to wardrobe her and shoot her because she literally was protruding a little bit. Um, and Kim was a huge star in those days. Michael Ironside was a big star and Kim was, um, a star, um, you know, having her first baby. And, um, and I remember we had to do a very sexy, like love making scene or whatever. And, and we shot it on a boat in, um, Marina del Rey. And, you know, why, why we couldn't have shot it on a set. They, I, I know why, because they, they, we, they used to shoot um, Tales from the Crypt in this friggin' building. It wasn't even a soundstage, but they turned this building into a soundstage on Venice Boulevard. And it was, it was a joke and they had no money. And so we shot on a boat and there was only enough room on the boat for me and Kim in this bunk bed. 
And it was a British director who had never really directed. He had always been a, a, a credits director. And he had done like the credits for all the Superman movies or some bullshit. And he, and he kept saying, I'm going to make it very sexy. We'll shoot hands and feet and maybe the, you know, the, it was a boat. So he said, you know, we put the feet, your feet, Kim, if you can put your feet on the ceiling, you know, that will be erotic or whatever, you know. She had a clause in her contract, no nudity, because Tails had would do nudity and stuff. Yeah. And she, no, I already feel like I'm a whale because I'm four months pregnant, right? And uh, and I remember that um, he kept pushing it, and I had done a movie of the week with Kim. Oh, now I'm forgetting whether I'd done the movie first with her. Somehow I knew her. Or maybe I'd, I can't forget, remember which I did first, but we worked together. We worked with her a couple of times. Anyway, I said to her and he kept saying, you know, what, what if you reach, you know, after you've made love, what would you do, Kim? You know, he says, yeah. and we want to make a film noir. So would you, can you smoke a cigarette? The cigarettes are right behind you. And they put the cigarettes behind her and above and they had put silk sheets. That's the thing. They put silk sheets on the boat. So the sheets were very slippery silk, you know? And she said, well, if I reach for it, then you know, my breasts are going to be hanging out. And he said, well, you know, do what's natural. It'll be fine. And she's like, no, I'm not doing that. And he said, well, I, but we really want you to smoke and stuff. And finally, I whispered in her ear and I said, Kim, look, you reach for it. it. It's okay with you. And I don't care. I truly don't care. I'll put my right hand on your right breast and I'll just keep the sheet right there. And she goes, great. Go for it. Go for it, Kev. So I did that. This guy goes on it. And the only other guy, they had a, they had a camera on a, on a, t- a tiny little pair of what we call railroad tracks so it could dolly back and forth along the thing. So there's a camera operator, the director, and Kim and me, and, and oh, and a focus puller. That's the only people. They literally had p- placed mics strategically so you didn't even have to have a boom operator in there. That's how small this boat, this sailboat was, or it felt that confined. And he kept bugging her and he kept bugging her. And I remember she was like, you know, like she had on a pair of pasties and, you know, like a thong or whatever. And, and, and I did too. And I finally got so frustrated that I just, I just said, I said, you want to shoot some nudity here? Shoot my bare ass. And I whipped my thing and I, and I, and I said, and, and I said, just, just shoot my bare ass. And, uh, and they ended up doing that. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't even know if it made it in the, in, in the, in the episode. It probably didn't, but it was, it was, I, I was so pissed at him because he put her in a really uncomfortable position and there was no need for it. Yeah. Her people had been clear. It was in her contract and why he pushed it. You know, he wanted to be edgy, whatever, you know, it's just bullshit, but I liked it because unlike, Lots of other tales from the crypts. It really was a film noir, and it was really done as a psychological thing, as opposed to a monster or a, some gremlin or something like that popping out of a closet. You know. Yeah. And uh, everybody was doing them in those days because I remember that. I remember visiting this. Uh, the, 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 I remember meeting Arnold Schwarzenegger. He he was directing the next episode, and he wanted to see. And he came on the set with a cigar. He always had these cigars. And he, He's like, oh, very nice to meet you. And I, I remember thinking, wow, he's actually a little shorter than me. He's just like this wide, you know. Um, and then I had to come back to do some dubbing there or something the following week after we had wrapped. And, uh, or I was coming out of a, tra- maybe it was the week we were shooting. I was coming out of my trailer. and Oh, no, it, we were shooting. That's right. I was coming out of my trailer and there was this big black limo there. And I, and the driver was leaning, you know, and he was in it like a chauffeur's in uniform. And he says, uh, I said to him, I said, Hey man. And I made a joke, like a bad joke. Cause it was right outside my door. I said, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad my car is here to take me home. And the guy like looked at me like, I've heard that a thousand times. How boring can you be? And I said, uh, whose car is it? And he says, it's Demi Moore's. And I said, it's Demi. I said, you mean Demi Moore? And the guy looks at me and he goes, Demi Moore. She had told everyone that her name, the pronunciation of her name truly in the French is Demi. Oh. So I looked at the guy and I just laughed like, you know, this is another one of those moments where suddenly, you know, everybody in the industry knows her as Demi Moore, but suddenly, you know, she puts her underwear on somehow differently from everybody else. Yeah. So I looked at the guy and I just sort of like, like Riley smiled and I went, oh yeah, right. Demi Moore. You know, like, Sorry, I made that mistake, pal. You know, like, what the hell? 
but that was um i remember having fun with michael ironside i remember it was really fun throwing the guy the actor that was her husband i remember it was fun that you know throwing him over the balcony and they had a big crash pad there and you know and it was uh i remember he was we were struggling like he was going to fall you know hundreds of feet and all that stuff it was it was cool it was fun that's awesome all right so i think i i think i know your answer to this but no go ahead because you told me a little bit of that uh like how you got into acting and what you were doing before but let's say in an alternate universe you never did the acting right what do you what do you think you kevin Kilner would be doing right now teaching and coaching probably coaching lacrosse and teaching, you know, or coaching football and teaching. Um, I probably would have gone into teaching. Yeah. Um, cause I grew up in the household of a teacher, you know, yeah. and I, my, and the really, you know, the, the hand, like, you know, I felt lucky. I, I had, you know, four or five teacher and coaches in my life that changed my life, like really changed my life. And, uh, and I know what they meant to me and I know how they helped me become who I was. And, uh, I've always thought if I could do that for a kid, you know, I'd feel pretty good about myself. You know, um, everybody used to say, including my, my parents were great. They were nothing but supportive, but my mom would occasionally say, you know, you can always go back to banking cause you've been a banker, you know? And I'm like, mom, never will happen. <laughs> I'm never going back to that bank. I'll do a lot of other things, but I'm not going to that bank. You know I mean? I'm a people person. I, I, I'd rather be with kids. I'd rather be, you know, doing that. So I'm pretty sure that's what I would be doing. You know, that's great. Well, you were great. What's the name of that play again that you were, uh, it's by Joshua Harmon. It's called admissions. And, uh, just, I think just opened in London. I'm pretty sure they told me. And, uh, so it's running there and, you know, we just closed. So, you know, it's, um, uh, but it'll be, it'll be going, nationwide i mean it's already been in new york and dc but it'll be everywhere i mean it'll they'll, they'll do it everywhere they'll do it in san francisco and la and seattle and 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 all that so uh, you know it, it, it's a really really well written piece of uh, theater you know so awesome well thanks again kevin you're yeah, awesome yeah man hey, be well and congratulations on your baby and uh, thank you this goes well for you i hope so too <laughs> you, when is this air when is your podcast uh Oh, well, this will probably air probably in like four. I'm trying to do a bunch of the interviews in a row because it's a lot sure. that goes into it. I'm yeah. going, I'm going back to school right now. I work full time Wow. and I had the newborn. So no, it's fun. I <laughs> love, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. I love, uh, I love having the opportunity to talk to people. When I first started that, this, me and my wife were talking and, uh, I was like, it's either I'm going to get a response or I'm going to get d- no response. Yeah. And, and the people have been, everybody I've talked to has been great. That's cool. That one person I've talked to, you know, people that are in one movie, like the kid that was in Ace Ventura Jr. I don't even know, know if you knew that they made an Ace Ventura Jr. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like a big budget movie and it kind of like fell apart. So it never got released and it was just bought by like Cartoon Network. And like, he was really cool. He's local. He's from Jersey. He's a, uh, he lives in New York now doing a bunch of improv classes. He's only like 25 or 24. No, but like everybody I've talked to is like super awesome. So, and you're on that list now. So thanks again, man. Like, thanks man. It was a, it was really fun talking to you and, yeah. and I, I truly, I wish you all the best with this yeah. and with your family. Go I ahead. wish you the best. I'm sure I'll see you on TV soon. Okay. Man. Pleasure. Take awesome. care. Bye. Those stories are so great. Weren't they? Kevin's a really great dude and he comes off, uh, just maybe it's a background on lacrosse, being on a national championship team with such a great coach, but he's just a great guy. And he loves acting. You know, he talked about it. He would do some free roles for student films, just really anything to act because he loves what he does. So I put his IMDb link in the notes so you could go check him out some more. And now the trailer for next week's movie. Hit comedies will often spawn a sequel, like the Police Academy and the Porky series. Meatballs 3, Summer Job is the last in a long line of lasts. Recorded in stereo, Meatballs 3 is now available on video. School's out, it's summer again, and the party's just getting started. 
So come on along. Join the meatballs for fun, sun, and plenty of crazy action. And after sexy angel Sally Kellerman hits heaven's gate. It's just the way I picture it. She's sent to earth to earn her wings. I think I've gone from horny to crazy. This is going to be tougher than I thought. And the whole place goes topsy-turvy when she turns the camp nerd into the last word in love. But you'll always be a loser. I wouldn't think that if I were you. So join Sally Kellerman. Get some rest, kid. Tomorrow's a big day. Come with me. In Meatballs 3. Okay, so I gotta be honest. I didn't even know they made a Meatballs 2, let alone a third. But I, for one, am happy they did. Find it. It's on YouTube. It's free. You'll thank me. You'll put me in your will. It is awesome. So subscribe to us so you don't miss out on this one and tell your friends. They'll love all these stories and the comedy things that we try to do. Or you can just laugh at us. Whatever you want to do. Uh, please write us a review. And follow us on Twitter at sequels only. Good night.